This is the tenth in a series of videos on an overview of the Bible. This particular lesson we're going to be talking in particular about Jesus Christ. Let me remind you, however, that the majority of people in the world don't even have a Bible. This is true not only of the world as a whole, but of Christendom as a whole. If you included all of the people in the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church and all Protestant denominations, there would be well over one billion people in the framework of Christendom. And I am told that statistically speaking, seven out of eight people, even in the framework of Christendom, do not have a Bible, have never touched one, or seen one. In our last lesson, we held up this little hand-operated uh, cassette player and pointed out that a lot of people in the world don't even have a written language. This particular tape that we played a little bit, I'll play a little bit for, uh, a little of it for you now. That's the Lisu language. Jesse Young Mi's voice, Jesse is a Lisu, just completed the trans a revision of the Lisu Bible. I have a friend named Robert Morse. He has been working on the Ruang Bible for 30 years. There have been thousands of Ruang Christians, but just recently have they had the Bible translated into their own language in its complete form, and most of them are illiterate, and after they get the Bible will not be able to read it unless someone reads it for them as Jesse Youngmi has done for the Lisu people. So the essence of Christianity cannot be anything technical or tedious. Now, for those of us who are English-speaking people and have sometimes a half a dozen Bibles in our homes, most of us have never read them all. I had a preacher tell me just within the last week or two that he's been preaching for 15 years, never even read all the books of the Bible like Habakkuk and Zephaniah and Haggai and the minor prophets of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, of the people who have read all the Bible, hardly anyone, if anyone, has studied all the Bible. There's a difference between reading through the book of Romans and studying the book of Romans. And for those of us who have studied from the Bible, almost invariably we study under someone else's guidance or direction. So we are deeply influenced by the people who teach us from the Word of God. But the thing we're trying to point out is that the essence of scriptural teaching is nothing complex and difficult. There are 66 different books in the Bible, and the first book talks about the beginning of everything. Here we find that initially, Adam and Eve were harmonious with one another and harmonious with God. There was no division. There were no problems in the Garden of Eden. Even a little rabbit could hop down a pathway without fear. But then came confusion. And the Bible teaches God is not the author of confusion but of peace. So the wicked one came and brought confusion into the Garden of Eden so that man began to fight with his fellow man, so that the animals turned upon one another. Initially, even the animals ate grass like oxen do. But after sin entered into the world, Eden became a snarling jungle. Now, Jesus Christ is going to correct all of this. When he takes away sin, we get back in harmony with God, and we also find a beautiful harmony one with another. In the book of Ephesians, and the first chapter, we read that the purpose of God was to sum up all things in Christ, not only the things which are in heaven, but also the things which are in the earth, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we find that this has literally been done, that there's no death, no sorrow, no pain, no war, no hatred, and there is beautiful harmony. Even the lion and the lamb can lie down together. The little child can play upon the hole of the cockatrice den. And there's a very beautiful verse in Revelation chapter 21 where John, who at this time was imprisoned on the island of Patmos off the coast of Asia Minor, said he saw a new heaven and a new earth, and there was no more sea. At that time, you see, it was the sea that separated him from his loved ones. But he said, when the new heaven comes 
and the new earth, there will be nothing to separate us. So we look forward to the time when men will once again beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and study war no more. And this was the ministry of Jesus who came to gather together in himself all things to create harmony and love and brotherhood. The four books about Jesus are called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Only four out of 66 doesn't sound like much, but when you compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with the other 27 books in the New Testament scriptures, you will discover that they compose well over one-third and almost one-half of the New Testament scriptures, just stories about Jesus. Let me talk to you just a little bit about the land of Palestine. It's a very small land. From Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south is less than 150 miles. From the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea is only approximately 70 miles. It's a very tiny country. There are some counties here in the United States of America that are much larger than the entire country of Palestine. It's unusual, as far as the topography of the, of the land is concerned, for this is the deepest spot upon the face of the earth. It's called the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea. It is 1,293 feet below sea level. The Jordan River flowing into it comes from the Sea of Galilee, which is itself 682 feet below sea level. This comes from the waters of Meram, which is approximately sea level, just seven feet above sea level. And then the uh, headwaters actually of the Jordan River come from Mount Hermon, which was about 9,000 feet above sea level. Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, but let me point out to you that every aspect of his life and ministry, his death and his resurrection, was prefigured centuries before it came to pass. Jesus did not just live and die, he lived and died according to the scriptures. He was not just raised again from the dead, he was raised again from the dead according to the scriptures. We are going to allow our hand to represent a little memory aid to help us keep the life and ministry of Jesus Christ in focus. We will allow this part of the hand, the thumb, and uh, up to our first finger to represent his birth and the 30 years preparation for his public ministry. Our four fingers will represent four different Passover feasts. Jesus began his public ministry at a Passover. This is recorded in John chapter 2. He went into the temple at Passover time. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He drove out these men who had corrupted the house of God. He concluded his ministry at a Passover. You recall the Last Supper? It was the Passover Supper. And he also cleansed the temple at that time as well. In between these four Passover feasts, there are, of course, three spaces representing the three years of his public ministry. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and then he left uh, because Herod wanted to kill him and went down into the land of Egypt. When he returned from Egypt, he went back to his hometown in Nazareth, which was in Galilee, and he stayed there until he was 12 years of age. At this time, he went down to the temple, and uh, his parents uh, thought each, each thought that he was with the other, and three days had passed, and when they found him, he was in the temple. It's kind of interesting. Little children are where their interests are. And Jesus had interests about godly things. Wished you not, he said, that I should be about my father's business. And then the next time we read about Jesus, he's about 30 years of age. And he left his home in Nazareth and went down to the wilderness of Judea and the Jordan River, which is just a narrow spot of the Jordan just above the Dead Sea. And here he was baptized of John in the River Jordan, and he began a public ministry in Judea which lasted six or seven months. Now, he was forced out of this ministry. Uh, the Bible teaches in John chapter 4 that he left Judea and departed again into Galilee and he must needs go through Samaria. I'm not certain exactly why he had to go through Samaria, but I rather imagine that his enemies were waiting for him at the fords of the Jordan and he couldn't go that way because they wanted to kill him. In John chapter 5, 
which is the second Passover of his public ministry, the Bible teaches the Jews therefore sought the more to kill him, not only because he had profaned the Sabbath day, but because he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Jesus then spent a year and three or four months in a Galilean ministry, and he concluded that ministry when no one would listen to him anymore. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the multitudes left him. He had just fed 5,000 men, besides women and children, with five loaves and two fish. But the multitudes didn't want to hear sermons about God. They wanted to eat and be filled. So Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Will you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of everlasting life. Then he retired with his disciples for about six months. We call this period the retirement and travels with the twelve. It was during this time that he took them to an exceeding high mountain. I think it was perhaps Mount Hermon. And it is interesting, when you get to a mountaintop, you have a totally different perspective than you might have at any other time in your life. And these men might never have traveled to that mountain. There is snow there almost the year round. They could see Mount Carmel, where Elijah had confronted the priests of Baal. They could see Decapolis. They could see Syria. They could see further than, in, than they had ever seen before. And while Jesus was on the mountain, there appeared Moses and Elijah, and they talked with him about his decease, which he should accomplish in Jerusalem, a thought which none of the disciples were ready to accept at this time. Jesus came down from the mountain and then back into Judea where he spent three months of his later Judean ministry over into Perea where he spent approximately three months in his later Perean ministry and then he came up the, up the road through Jericho to Jerusalem that he might die. Now, I want to keep stressing the fact that the devil is the author of confusion. He's the one that causes wars and rumors of wars. He's the one that creates difficulties and problems in the earth. Jesus came that he might destroy the works of the devil and bring peace and harmony to mankind. His every lesson, his every action was to bridge the gap and cause people to love one another. That's the message of Jesus. That's the message of the scriptures. We live in a divided world. We have two Germanys. We have two Koreas. We have two Chinas. The world is divided racially and socially, religiously, ethically, and uh, in virtually every way. And the Lord wants to bring peace to you. And maybe some of you have been having family problems. The Lord is a bridge builder. He wants to cause people to love one another, not to be argumentative and to fight. Now, as he was preparing to go to the cross, he was in the upper room. We've talked about this in a previous lesson. And his own disciples were fussing and fighting. They had heard all the sermons and all the lessons about love and harmony and peace and brotherhood, and yet there they were arguing as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus girded himself about with a towel and began to wash his disciples' feet. He said, do you understand what I'm doing? I don't know whether they did, and I sometimes wonder even if I do. But he was aware that they could not love on their own. So he said, it is expedient for you that I go away. I have to get out of this body. When I'm in the body, I cannot be everywhere at the same time. When I'm in Jerusalem, I cannot be in Capernaum. When, I'm in, when I am in Capernaum, I cannot be in Decapolis. I can only be one place at a time in this physical body. But if I go away, I will become a spirit. And as a spirit, I can be everywhere at the same time. So in the upper room, at the Last Supper, he said, I will not leave you orphans, or some versions read comfortless, but I'm going to the Father, and I will come back, and I will dwell in your heart, and I'm going to give you new power and new strength. When he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, there's a sense in which the commandment to love is not new. Moses talked about love in the book of Deuteronomy. Love your neighbor as yourself is found in Leviticus chapter 19. That commandment's not a new commandment in one sense. But I think perhaps what he was getting at is this. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus said, you're going to speak with new tongues. I think that promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when those people spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They spoke in the language of the Parthians, the Medes, the dwellers of Mesopotamia. 
from all these different countries of the world. Now, those languages were not new languages. They were very old languages. But the power to speak them was radically new. It was a supernatural ability which these men had. They'd never studied those languages, and yet all those people heard them speak fluently in these different nationalities. So when Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, the reason why it's new is that we have a brand new power to love. And all of a sudden, when men are driving nails into our hands and into our feet, instead of crying out in bitterness against them, we respond with the Spirit of Jesus. He said, if I go to the Father, I'll come and I'll dwell in your heart. I'm going to enable you to love that neighbor who has said so many unkind, bitter things. I'm going to enable you to love that husband or that wife from whom you are estranged. I am going to dwell in you and you are going to produce a new kind of life. You will produce the fruit of the Spirit. When he left the upper room and started toward the Garden of Gethsemane, he paused somewhere, perhaps in the area of the temple, and he prayed his high priestly prayer. It's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Scriptures. It is found in John chapter 17. There are three parts to the prayer. The first part is for himself. This may very well be the only time that Jesus after ever lifted up his voice in his own behalf and he said, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Then he prayed for his disciples, not for the world, but for the disciples that God had given him, that the disciples may be one. The last part of the prayer is for you and for me. He said, neither pray I for these alone. I'm not just praying now for my disciples, not just for them alone, but for all who shall believe on me through their testimony. If you believe in Jesus, as I believe in Jesus, it's through the testimony of the apostles. Now, what does he want for us? We have a lot of problems and a lot of needs. We need to be generous. We need to pray. We need to be benevolent. We need to be evangelistic. There are a lot of things we need to do. But the one thing that took priority and precedence over everything else was we need to get along with one another. He said, Father, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou didst send me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. And Jesus knew that when the disciples, those who believe in him, were one, something miraculous would happen and the world would believe. When the devil came to Adam and Eve and said, If you will eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God knowing good and evil. There was a sense in which that's true. Up to that point, Adam and Eve had only known good. Everything that God made was good. The devil said, if you will eat of that tree, you will know good and you will know evil. The word for evil in the Hebrew language is ra. It comes from the root ra, which means fragmentation or to break in pieces. Up to that point in time, everything was good. Everything was harmonious. There was peace and tranquility. But when they ate of the forbidden fruit, they knew fragmentation. They knew what it was to have hatred and bitterness. They knew what it was to see Cain rise up against his brother and take his life. Jesus came to produce harmony and peace. And he says, if it won't work at home, don't export it. If I cannot get my disciples to love one another, why go out? Why send them anywhere to evangelize if they cannot get along even with one another? So this was a top priority in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, to get his disciples to love one another. And up to this point, after all these lessons, after three years of sermons, they were fighting and fussing the very night he was betrayed and the very night before he was crucified. Jesus said, but when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he's going to produce fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit, as you well know, is love. After his crucifixion and resurrection, he taught them 40 days things concerning the kingdom. And then he stood on a mountain outside Jerusalem and told them something which they were incapable of understanding at that time. 
He said, I want you to go and teach all nations. Now, the word for nations in the Greek language is ethnoi, and that's the word translated as Gentile over and over and over in the Bible. We get our English word ethnic from it. Jesus commissioned these men to go out into all the ethnic groups of the world and preach the gospel because Jesus did not just come to save one segment of society or one group of people. He came for all the peoples of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me tell you about my day. I had intended to come in a little early and do some book work, getting ready for this particular lesson, and I didn't get to do it. The reason was when I got to the office, there were some problems waiting for me. There was a man who's dying of cancer who had written to me asking a favor that I write to a friend. I took the time to do it. Today's Monday and yesterday, there was a woman in church who was nearing a nervous breakdown. She's had family problems for a number of years, and now her daughter has run off with another man, abandoned her husband and child, and she was nearing the end. I took time to talk to her. There was a man so desperately depressed and sick that he asked the elders of the church to come over last night and pray with him. We did that, and I knew that in addition to the physical problems which beset this man, in addition to the spiritual oppression he was facing, he was having some financial burdens. He had some bills he was unable to pay. I took him by some money this morning. When I got back to the office, I took time to write to another terminally ill individual who has been in the hospital for some time, and I thought they might be depressed and discouraged. You know, that's really the kind of world in which we live. And I keep trying to stress the fact that when people come to church, they are not interested in some technical hair-splitting theological argument. They're coming because they're brokenhearted or because they're sick or because their mother's dying of cancer or because they've got financial problems. And as a last resort, they're reaching out. I've asked a number of times in our congregation for people to tell me what I preached on the week before. It's amazing how quickly we forget. And sometimes I even forget myself. Because the real essence of Christianity is not something tedious. It's not something technical. It's something very, very basic. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Not because of some technical point of church government or theology. That's not the reason why people know that you belong to Jesus. It's because you've got a different kind of a life. That's the key. As we've tried to say, the Bible message is love. That's the central message of the entire Bible. And if that's the message of the whole Bible, it's in particular, I think, the message of the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and Luke chapter 6. In this particular part of the Bible, Jesus continually makes a contrast between legalism and love. He says, You have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Then he gave a far stricter regulation than that. He said, I say to you that even if you look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. He said, now you've heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But Jesus gave a far more narrow view of religion than that. He said, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to shine upon the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. To be perfect does not mean to be without sin. It means to be mature, as God is mature. God loves everybody, even the people driving nails into his hands and feet. And when you have the Spirit of God in you, you become complete and mature like God is, and you love everyone. If you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publican so? One of the first verses of Scripture which I memorized as a young Christian was Matthew 7, 13, and 14. It teaches, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. 
because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. It was years later that I discovered verse 12. Verse 12 teaches, Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them? For this is the law and the prophets. Now what God has joined together, man should not put asunder. Therefore, the golden rule is the straight gate and the narrow way. The emphasis on love, which causes you to love your neighbor as yourself, is the straight gate of which Christ was talking about. The legal gate is a broad gate. It enables the priest and the Levite to pass by on the other side and avoid the man who has a problem. The narrow gate is the gate of love. The Sermon on the Mount is concluded with a very practical illustration. Jesus said, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken unto a wise man which built his house upon the rock. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, didn't fall, because it was founded upon a rock. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The essence then of Christ's teaching is it's not just hearing that causes you to be like Jesus, it is doing. I think Edgar A. Guest spoke for virtually all the peoples of the world when he wrote this beautiful poem. I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I would rather one would walk with me than merely show the way. For the eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the ones who live their creeds for to see good put in action. That's what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if I only see it done. My eyes can watch your hands, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very fine and true, but I'd rather get my lessons from observing what you do. I may misunderstand you and the fine advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Thank you.